challenging cases. Uh, Volcano for this opportunity and for the support that they've given us over, uh, you won't believe this, but I started with them in 1984, yes, 84. Um, and so that's, uh, that's been a, a long ride and very, very thankful uh, to them. I don't think this will move unless something happens. There we go. So here's what I'm going to try to cover very quickly here. The implications of treating a side branch and, and um, the use of IBIS, a little bit on the use of FFR. I'm going to leave most of that uh, to my colleague and then try to leave you with kind of a take-home uh, message for how to, how to do this on a real day-to-day -day basis. So here are the implications. If you treat the side, side branch, we know there's a higher restenosis rate. We know there's a higher stent thrombosis rate. It obviously increases the complexity of the procedure, uh, double wires, double stents, kissing balloons, et cetera, bigger guides. And it increases the equipment costs while you still get paid for one vessel. Um, and it's unclear whether that really affords any clinical benefit uh, to the patient. So I think the current uh, feeling, and it may change this, this uh, year, as it often does, is to try to avoid uh, stenting the side branch if you can. And what I'm going to hopefully show you is that using IVIS and sometimes FFR, you can uh, do that. Now, there are many schema of branch classifications. Uh, the Medina uh, grading, of course, has gotten a lot of uh, press in recent years. Um, I think any of these are fine. All of them are useful for uh, doing scientific studies. None of them will help you day to day. Okay? Day to day, every patient's different. You've got to get in there and figure out what they actually have. And you can't do it with an angiogram, in my mind. So we know that there's diffuse, unrecognized disease by IVIS. Everybody here, I'm sure, has done IVIS, and you know that. So there's disease everywhere that we don't see by angiogram, and it becomes important in our planning of these kinds of complex cases. This is, a, I think, a very nice uh, little paper uh, showing um, the different classifications of uh, side branches based on IBIS. The one on your far left labeled number one uh, shows the side branches not involved. The one in the middle with sort of focal disease in the side branch and the one on the far right showing diffuse disease in the side branch. And it turns out that these classifications, here's an example of one where there is no disease in the side branch and after the main branch stenting, the side branch stays open. Here's another example where there's a lot of diffuse disease in the side branch, and after main branch stenting, the side branch becomes occluded. And what these folks found is that in the, main, in the, in the cases uh, of group one where the side branch was not involved by IBIS, they very uh, infrequently had any problem. But in the cases where uh, the side branch was involved by IBIS, there was a fairly high rate of occlusion after stenting of the main branch, and it turns out if you had a diffuse pattern, every one of those branches occluded. So let me show you an example. Here's a guy with a mid-LED lesion. Now some of you may question, well, that doesn't look that bad. Um, and he had had a right coronary stented as part of a STEMI. And in fact, at that time, the FFR in that LED was 0.72. And so he was now being brought back for an elective uh, intervention to that mid-LED. Again, shows the importance of FFR. Watch here, that's the side branch there at 7 o'clock that just came by. And if I can get this mouse to work, there we go. Let me just scroll back to that. I want you to see that. So here's the side branch right there, and it's wide open. There's really no disease in there. Okay, so that is this kind of pattern over here. There it is, the picture. Uh, and in fact, when we did that intervention just stented across the main branch. You see the side branch stays widely open. And you go, well, yeah, but look at that. It's a little bit narrowed. And this is where the FFR helps you. And I don't want to get too much into FFR, but the FFR in that side branch is 0.86, and we leave it alone. OK? So they'll often look kind of funky. But as my colleague will share with you, uh, they rarely need something done. And then here is a. Uh, movie that doesn't play, and here's a movie with color that does play, and you can see with the chroma flow, you get a very nice uh, view of that side branch with plenty of uh, flow going into it. Nice stent uh, uh, apposition and expansion. <coughs> here's a, uh, a case that, that I have found um, very instructive, and I, and I hope that uh, it doesn't seem too crazy to you. Uh, this is a, a gentleman who had had bypass surgery six months earlier. He had a total occlusion of the circumflex. As you can see, there's no circumflex here in the ileocaudal or in the areocaudal. 
And the vein graft to a circumflex had failed twice already in the past six months with acute MIs and, and emergency stenting. And so rather than let him fail the third time, the attempt was to go in and try to open this circ. Now the strategy was, let's put an IVUS in here. If we can find where the origin of the circ is by IVUS, then perhaps we can go ahead and treat it. So here's the IVUS, first step in the vessel. And right here at this narrowed spot, you can actually see the circumflex totally occluded there off to the, to the lower right. So once we've established that the circumflex is in fact there, then we load him up with a bunch of hardware for the CTO. This is coming from his arm, going into the vein graft to the uh, circumflex, which provides this retrograde flow over here. The six French catheter to hold the IVUS and the eight French catheter to do the working stuff with uh, what's going to turn out to be a venture catheter and the wires, etc. Here's the other view now with a dual injection showing the really not very good insertion site over here. This graft was already very diseased at the proximal portion that you can't see. We see there's a short gap here. I've already pre-dilated this lesion in the distal left main. And now we're going to use a venture catheter to direct that Asahi wire into the lesion under IVUS guidance. So we're watching the wire from the IVUS. There's multiple wires here, obviously. So there's two wires there, and we are watching the wire with the IVUS go towards the spot where we knew the circ ostium was. And then here we are successfully over there in that space. Now, this next movie would have been showing you that sort of bouncing back and forth, but it is not playing, unfortunately. Uh, but you would see the wire in here coming back through into the left main. So we're watching the with the IVUS directing the wire into that space where we knew it was. Initially, it goes kind of subintimal here. We use the venture there then to re-poke back in. I did not have a um, stingray balloon, so we use the venture to poke back into the lesion. And then we end up with the wire all the way down, obviously lots of dissection. And then let me show you a little IVUS run now up through here just to document what's going on. We're going to start about here. So there's the distal vessel. Going to move backwards, still got a nice open lumen, and then we're going to start to see this dissection. And I wanted to show you the way this looks uh, inside and outside the lumen. Uh, you're starting to get the false lumen, and actually, I'm in the false lumen and the true lumen. False lumen, true lumen. Come back down here, same thing, false and true lumens. Coming up further, now we're starting to see where it reconnects. Now we're closer up to the top here, we're reconnecting, and as we come into the uh, bifurcation, we're going to get into the diffuse disease that was the original lesion. Here's the very heavily calcified osteal portion. Now we're into the right at the bifurcation. So this is the LED wire, and we're coming up from the circ. Now we're back in the left main with the second wire being seen here. So we can establish where we are and then uh, go ahead, put some stents in. We're going to finish off. I had to remember dilate that lesion in here, so we end up with a culotte in the left main, and it looks like this at the end, with the big left main stent there, right at the bifurcation there, with a nice uh, wide open bifurcation, kind of down into the circ, looking back now, same way, mid vessel here, and this unstented section in here. And then finally, the stented section down here at the old insertion site of the graft. So using the IVUS every step of the way to guide exactly what we're doing there, but particularly to guide the wire into that lesion. Now these ostea are often difficult to evaluate, and you're going to see more data on this. They are, let me just say, rarely significant, okay, by uh, FFR. And there's a wide range of uh, lesions with percent stenosis that have a wide range of uh, FFR. And uh, the angiogram is really not a good way to uh, tell. So here is a tight lesion now in the circumflex. And we're going to do IBIS on that. And as we pull back, you can see now that, that there are really two OMs, or a ramus and an OM, whatever you want to call those, and then the LAD. And so you can see that this branch is widely patent. Then there's a tight lesion that we're actually stenting. There's the second branch. 
And then we're going to run into the third branch, which is the LED, in just a second here. No, we're actually not. So this movie stops a little early. Uh, we're back into the left main here. This is after that first stent. So now we've got the ramus and the LED there that we have to deal with. And we're now coming back from the circ into the stent. And we're going to have the ramus there and then the LED and into the left main. And let me just go back here if I can. Show you the angiogram. I think everyone would be a little bit worried that the ostiums, particularly this ramus, looks a little bit tight. The LED FFR was low. I was less worried about the LED, but there it is, it's low. Um, we do a kissing balloon, it doesn't look much better. But afterwards, the FFR is okay, and the FFR and the ramus is okay, and we finish up like that, and this is a good couple of years now, and do it, still doing fine. Okay, so again, using the IBIS showed that they were not that diseased, ended up staying open. Uh, one needed a little bit of a kissing balloon. So some technical tips here, use at least a seven French guide so you've got some options for multiple balloons, multiple wires, multiple other catheters. Use a second wire in all cases. There's no harm to have a second wire in a branch and then pull it out after you put the main branch stent in. Figure out one technique and get comfortable with it. For me, I like the culotte technique, and the culotte technique is like this. You put a branch in either the side or the main, and then you have to recross through it, put a second stent in, and then do kissing at the end. So that's a technique that I find very comfortable. Uh, you may have other techniques, but whatever it is, get comfortable with one of them. I always try to avoid stenting both branches unless both are heavily diseased by IBIS, and I always use IBIS to figure that out because the angiogram just doesn't tell you. You always finish with a kissing balloon if you do anything in the side branch. If you touch the side branch in any way, always finish with a kissing uh, balloon at the end. And then just some, you know, how do you place stents? If you're going just for osteoplacement and only one branch is involved, let's say a left main uh, LED circ bifurcation, sometimes you just want to come right to the osteum of the LED. You can use the IBIS and fluoro to define the osteo placement. It's another little trick here, which I've begun using quite successfully. You put a six French dilator over the stent. You, bl you leave just the proximal end of it out from under the dilator. You blow up the balloon that lifts the end of the struts up off. You have a wire in the circ, a wire in the LED. You put the wire that's going to the branch that you're not stenting through the stent strut, and then you push the whole thing up and that second wire, when it starts to bend, you know you're right at that ostium. And this works very well to get the end of the stent right at the bifurcation. And then after you inflate the uh, balloon, you can pull that second wire out. It's obviously through the stent, so you've got to pull it out. This uh, works very nicely, as does uh, the IBIS uh, identification of where the carina is. There are some new imaging techniques that I think we're still the jury is out on. This is some VH stuff and some OCT showing that the distal rim of these bifurcations may have a thicker cap than the proximal portion. What implications that's going to have is not clear, but just to let you know, there is some investigation going on about what other imaging techniques might add in our assessment of these bifurcations. So in summary, angiography overestimates the need for side branch angioplasty. IVUS provides better evaluation of the true side branch involvement. FFR, as you'll hear in a second, is an accurate way to determine those side branches needing PCI. Decisions on side branch PCI require adjunctive technique. If you are just guessing from what you see on the angiogram, you are doing just that. You are just guessing. So here's the take home protocol. Try to avoid side branch angioplasty if at all possible. Do pre-intervention IVUS on all of them. If IVA shows no side branch disease, then go ahead and stent the main branch. Now, do I put a wire down the side branch? Yeah. There's no harm, no loss there. Just pull it out at the end if it's all fine. If IVA shows diffuse side branch disease, then you do an upfront planned two stent technique, and whether that's culotte or T or however you want to do that, whatever you're comfortable with. If IVA shows focal side branch disease, then I do provisional. And if after I put the main branch stent in, the side branch looks more than 70%, um, then you do FFR to figure out what to do. And only if it is low 
do you uh, start with a, a kissing balloon and perhaps if you can't get that to work, end up with a stent? So it's a stepwise approach, all of it dependent on these adjunctive techniques. Thank you very much.